Let's read together this morning before Peter comes up. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, and we're going to find the significance in a name, not only this week, but we're going to find it next week. It's all about his name. Actually, verse 3, uh, chapter 3. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried where they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and he began to walk and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognised him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. If you have your Bible or other form of uh, media, uh, tablet or phone, uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Today I'm going to be following on from Dave's message just a couple of weeks back. Of course, last week Wayne brought a a one-off topical uh, sermon, but we're going through the book of Acts and we're up to this week, chapter 3. But last, uh, two weeks back when Dave spoke, uh, we were in that passage where we witnessed the inauguration of God's church through the imparting and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Of course, uh, we know that as Pentecost. You may recall back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told the disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's a part of what SIL is doing that we've just heard about this morning. This is actually God's unchanging mission plan in one succinct sentence. The whole rest of the book of Acts is simply, uh, in essence, an unfurling of this mission plan, which, of course, is still being played out today and will until all have heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, back in Old Testament times, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he was only given to certain people, such as kings, judges, prophets. He would come upon them And he would come upon them for a specific time, for a specific purpose. But now, post-Pentecost, he's been sent to permanently indwell the hearts and lives of every born-again believer. It's from this context that as we look at Acts chapter 3, we're going to see five scenes or responses which should both encourage and empower us as they point us to the truth that it is God's continuing active intervention and direction which is both growing and establishing his church today. We will see how through these five responses that God employs enduring principles to carry out the fulfillment of Jesus' words in Matthew 16, where he said, I will build my church 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice, I, Jesus, said, I will build my church. This portion, portion of scripture should really encourage us that it's neither politicians nor any other global power struck organization or any other scheme of man which determines the destiny of God's church. God alone is the one who sovereignly directs the course of his church. Our chapter opens with our two leading apostles. Thank you, David, for that reading this morning. We've just heard how Peter and John heading off to temple as part of their daily devotion to pray. We shouldn't be surprised at this, should we? Because Luke clearly shows us through the entire book of Acts that prayer is not only a major theme for this young church, but it's an essential element Prayer is an essential element to personal sanctification, to corporate unification, and of course, to the extending of the kingdom of God. As Peter and John approach the temple, they see a man sitting on the steps of what was known as the beautiful gate. He was lame. And he was begging arms of those who passed him by on their way to the temple to pray. And so we see here our first scene, our first response, and it's a lame man's request. Now, there's nothing ordinary about this scenario. It played out every day, uh, multiple times, multiple locations all over Jerusalem and beyond. Part of the Jewish moral code was to give alms to the less fortunate. And of course, any smart beggar would know that Jewish worshippers were most likely to become generous as they went in to pray. The gate was not only an ideal location for begging, but it also represented the farthest point that this beggar could go because invalids were not allowed to enter the temple beyond the precinct of the Gentiles. Tragically, this man could stop at the gate to the temple, but he could never enter. Verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. The cry for alms would have become for this beggar quite rote, much like a, a, a vendor in a market selling apples. Get your apples. Arms. Arms here. Peter did not want to engage with this man at that superficial level. He wanted the man's complete attention. And so, verse 4, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them. He fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. And so we see here not only the lame man's request, but in a minute we're going to see also a detailed account of Peter's response to him. So let's look together now at our second scene, Peter's response, verse 6. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. This man's request was a simple felt need just to buy food, enough money to stay alive for the day. But Peter, empowered, in, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and directed by God himself, offered this man so much more than just a meal for a day. And so Peter reached out and took hold of the, the man's hand. It probably would have been the very hand he was holding out to receive arms. And immediately pulled him up 
causing him to stand upright for the first time in his life. This wasn't something Peter did on a whim or as a promotional event. He did it under the specific prompting and anointing of the Holy Spirit. God gave Peter the supernatural ability to trust him for something completely out of the ordinary. And notice that Peter makes very clear at this point that this ability or, or power to do such a thing, it didn't come from Peter. It's not his own. He declares in front of all and directly to this lame man, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Interesting term that, isn't it? This term in, in the name of. We say it when we pray. We were taught that. It signifies the authority of or uh, of the named one. One's name in Semitic thought conveyed the very nature, the essence or the authority of their being. Hence, the power of the person was available to, let's call it his agent, in the name of that person. Do you remember watching many, you're far too young, most of you. Many years ago, we used to have cops and robber shows on TV. And it was almost like the Keystone Cops. You know, the robber had come out of the bank and he'd run off down the road and of course out came the copper with his truncheon and he'd chase after him. Stop in the name of the law. Of course, the robber never stopped, did he? But the point here is that that copper had the entire authority and power of the law behind him. And the intent is the same here. Watch out as we go through chapters three and four. Uh, in the name of Jesus is a recurring theme, Luke referring to it no less than eight times. Well, what an unexpected and certainly unforeseen morning that all had, right? Who here knows that life can become unpredictable? Life can sometimes feel random, chaotic and very arbitrary. Gee, we're right in the middle of that, aren't we? I mean, think back to that event though. Consider how, shall we say, fortunate <laughs> that just at the right time this man was laid at the temple gate. And it just so happened that Peter and John were just passing at this time and how fortunate that they saw the man and bothered to engage with him. You might say, what an extremely fortunate set of circumstances. Sometimes you and I feel like we're just living in a giant pinball game, bouncing off the circumstances of life. Sickness, work, relationship failures, financial concerns, lockdowns. But friends, this was no random accident. This was not some chance encounter. This was a preordained, sovereignly planned and God-directed meeting at a particular time and place for a particular and divine purpose. God builds his church through God-ordained circumstances. Well, not only had God predetermined that this man would be sitting begging there, but he also ordained that he would use Peter and John to heal him. God not only ordains the circumstances, but he also uses men and women whom he gifts for that particular task. I don't want to dwell too long here on the healing itself, as marvelous and as miraculous uh, as it was, uh, because the healing, I don't believe, is Luke's main focus in this passage. 
He goes on to simply set the scene through this man's exuberant joy and praise of God for his healing so that a huge crowd came together. Look in verse eight there. And leaping up, the lame man, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were all filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. That was the purpose. That's exactly the response that God had intended. Peter wisely takes advantage of the gathering crowd he knows that the phenomenon of the miraculous in itself brought no one to Jesus. It merely arouses interest. Though they were filled with wonder and greatly amazed, they weren't yet saved. And so we read in verses 11 and 12, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the, pe the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? <laughs> I love that verse. It's a rare commodity, a humble preacher. <laughs> a preacher who fears God and who knows not to take God's glory for himself. Why stare at us? Verse 12, it wasn't us. We had neither the power nor the, the, the piety, the, the holiness to do this. Do you recognize this man, Peter? Peter? This incredibly transformed disciple, Peter, who just a few weeks earlier was cowering beside a fire, warming his hands and denying the Lord three times. Weak and afraid, on the edge of despair and until upon the beach one morning, he has a personal encounter with the now risen, now living God who restores Peter from despair to a place of hope, from being powerless and fearful to now a courageous and articulate preacher and advocate for the gospel. I wonder this morning, friends, I wonder, have, have you had a personal encounter with the risen and living God? Have you come to an end of yourself and felt the, the cold grip of despair and failure? Take heart. God is the master potter and he's able to remodel and repair any pot which yields itself to him. Well now, this is, uh, this is Peter's second sermon to an enormous crowd. The first, just back in chapter two where Dave was, uh, it was at Pentecost and we saw there some 3,000 believed and were baptized. And now again, Peter recognizes that God in his providence has provided another enormous crowd. So let's read together verses 12 through 16. And when Peter saw it, this is the crowd of course, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him but you denied the holy and righteous one. And you asked for murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, 
whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And in his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong who you see now. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Peter's sermon begins in verse 12 as he deals with any misconception about who did the miracle. But it's not until the latter part of verse 13 that we begin to see Peter in full preaching mode, in full flight, bringing a stern and stinging rebuke. Here's our third scene. Have you ever been in a really dark room, maybe a bedroom with with, with block out curtains or something like that. And suddenly someone tears them open and it's like, oh, it burns. It seems that the strong contrast between the two experiences make the difference all the more vast. And we're going to see here how Peter perhaps unwittingly employs this simple principle Because good news is only good when it's seen against the backdrop of evil. You know, the biggest problem today, I was talking to someone this morning, people don't think they need a saviour because they don't think they're bad. Peter begins by alerting, now note the language here, men of Israel to their spiritual heritage. Peter reminds them of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He wants no confusion here that this Messiah is the one and only sent by the God of their fathers. And it was he who glorified his servant, Jesus. That's prophetic language, isn't it? His servant. That's straight out of Isaiah 42, 45, 53, 11. And now having correctly identified Christ and their historical and covenantal link with him, Peter goes on to reveal the depth of their culpability in his death. Look at Peter's language here, verse 13. You delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. Can you see the irony here? They chose Barabbas, a murderer, one who ends life in place of the one who brings life, the one who creates life. Verse 16 brings this first part of Peter's sermon to a conclusion. As Peter feels he's sufficiently explained the background and and the context of the miracle occurring, but there are two main points that we can draw from what he's said here. And that is that this miracle which results in the lame man walking was totally dependent upon the power which is associated with the name of Jesus. And that this power only became effective by faith in the name of Jesus. You know, the greatness of this sermon of Peter's, the greatness of it was that it was all about Jesus. The the focus of the sermon was not on Peter or anything that he had done, but it was all about Jesus. As we read on now, having called the crowd to account for their wicked and sinful rejection of the Messiah. Listen here as we sense a change in Peter's tone. Acts 17 to 21, read along with me now. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he might send the Christ, 
appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoring all things, which uh, the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophet long ago. Here's our fourth scene. This is Peter's call to repent. Did you, did you hear that change in Peter's tone? Did you feel the language shift? Instead of that harsh and accusative, you men of Israel, it's now brothers. Perhaps Peter's response here is shaped by that all too recent and painful memory of himself around that fire, warming his hands, denying the Lord. Although Peter does rightly bring blame to their shoulders, he also shows that what occurred was actually all the plan of God. In his complete sovereignty, he brought about all those events and he brought them about to accomplish his own purposes. And therefore, because they had acted in, in ignorance, there was for them opportunity for forgiveness, for redemption, if they would humble themselves and repent. Maybe this morning that His great mercy is allowing you a glimpse of that light of hope poking through the curtain of despair. For many that day, the curtains had been drawn back and they stood in the dazzling splendor of God's holy grace and redemption. Peter and John now having clearly acknowledged before the growing crowd, Jesus as the Christ, God's holy Messiah, and having identified those present as being corporately and personally responsible for the Messiah's rejection and death, Peter calls upon them to respond, to repent and to allow God's mercy to wash over them. That's God's grace. I'm grateful for something. God's grace is active for us today. We too, who acted in ignorance and feel the guilt and weight of the shame, we too can come and be washed in the grace and mercy of God. Our final scene from this chapter is a warning of rejection. And so Peter concludes his sermon by warning. Verse 22 and 23, let's read together. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to the prophet shall be destroyed from the people. Listen to him. Where have we heard that before? Listen to him. It's what the father said at Jesus' baptism. This is my son. Listen to him. Again, on Jesus' transfiguration. Quiet, Peter and John. This is my son. Listen to him. And Peter now brings that same message from their beloved patriarch, Moses. Listen to him. The warning is clear and also consistent through history. The same warning looms large to us today. To reject God's offer of salvation through his son Jesus Christ can and will lead to certain utter ruin and eternal spiritual death. As the crowd gathered around Peter and John and, and the healed beggar. The last thing they were expecting was to be blamed for a murder. <laughs> the sting of Peter's words were perhaps 
what led to their arrest the next, in the next chapter, and we'll see that in chapter 4 next week. Please read ahead. <laughs> read ahead. Read chapter 4 for next week. But what we see here is that the forgiveness of Christ is offered to the enemies of Christ. No one really sees themselves as enemies of Christ. It's one of the hardest concepts to grasp. But the Bible says that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us, Romans 5. And then in 1 Corinthians, that we've all lived in rebellious sin before a perfectly holy God. Those who reject the gospel simply think they're keeping their option open or keeping an open mind or, or maybe waiting for more convincing proof. But the problem is not a lack of evidence. It's our faulty interpretation of the evidence. Like the Jews of Peter's day who acted in ignorance, there came a second chance. Such is the grace of God. But know this, we do not know about tomorrow. In the hourglass of our life, we can see the sand at the bottom, but we have no idea how much is left in the top. Know this, we must not presume upon God's grace. Make today the day of salvation. Let me conclude with these words from, chapter, uh, from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15. As it is said today, today, if you hear his voice, Today, if you see that glimmer of light from behind the curtain of despair, today, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Friends, today, today, will you let the Lord in to your heart? If you've not done that, and for those of you who know the Lord, I hope that you can learn to trust him in the midst of a chaotic world and a life that's so topsy-turvy. It's okay. God's still got it. His hands are firmly on the steering wheel of our destiny and nothing, nothing can change that. Let's pray together. Father, this morning you have shown us through this portion of scripture a very clear picture of the way in which you began to and will continue to build your church. And Lord, we are amazed at the way in which by your sovereign grace you have and continue to take God-gifted people who proclaim your inspired, spirit-driven word through God-ordained circumstances. Lord, it won't be for many of us to stand before great crowds, but Lord, help us to recognise that every meeting, great or small, is ordained by you, whether it's over the back fence or at the lunch table at work. Help us to see the lame man that you've brought into our lives. Give us courage to not just toss a gold coin, to suffice for the day, but give us a holy boldness to declare the life-giving words of our simple testimony. Father, I ask you this morning, for any here who have not yet come to a place of trusting Christ for their eternal future, would you draw them? By your Holy Spirit, would you trouble and convict their hearts that they might reach out to you and to know the joy which can only come from a forgiven life and a transformed heart. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.